Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much to Helen and Molly for this event. It's a real honor to speak here. Yep, and apologies if I uh, rush through, especially slides that echo what others have previously presented. But I, uh, I've got a lot of ground to cover, as you can see from the title. So I found this image really striking. This is an image from Hiroshima after the bombing, actually, but I just found it so remarkably similar to the post-tsunami uh, scenes that we all remember from two years ago. And of course, the comment has been made that even by the likes of the Prime Minister of Japan at the time, that the events of March 11th, 2011 are are similar in magnitude and importance as things like the Hiroshima atomic bombing to the Japanese nation. So this is a view of Fukushima Daiichi before the catastrophe began. And I was invited on a speaking tour of Japan in August of 2010, seven months before the catastrophe. And I stood on a bluff over the Pacific that uh, looked down on Fukushima Daiichi. My first stop was Okuma and Futaba on the speaking tour. So three and a half miles to the north, I could see the six reactors like this. And three and a half miles to the south, from where I stood, I could see the Daini uh, nuclear power plant with four reactors. And uh, it's little known, but a single off-site power line is what saved Daini, more operating reactors than at Daiichi, from a similar catastrophe. Several off-site power lines were lost to the earthquake. The emergency diesel generators were lost to the tsunami. And uh, that was the kind of scenario that Prime Minister Khan, his, at the time, Chief Cabinet Secretary Adano, admitted to the Rebuild Japan Initiative Foundation. And the headlines came out on the first anniversary of the Fukushima catastrophe. They feared a demonic chain reaction of atomic reactor meltdowns and pool fires. Six reactors, well, three operating at Daiichi, but seven pools at Daiichi four operating reactors at Daini and four pools, one reactor and one pool at Tokai, closer to Tokyo. And that's where the headlines came from about the possibility of having to evacuate Tokyo if that worst case scenario had played out. 30 million people. But something that the filmmaker Kurosawa envisioned in his film Dreams in 1990 in the part called Mount Fuji in Red atomic reactors exploding behind Mount Fuji, as seen from Tokyo. So here are the explosions at the Unit 1 and the Unit 3, and the aftermath in mid-March of 2011. But it's not the, uh, the first time, and I should mention that the, uh, the reactors, of course, are General Electric Mark I boiling water reactors, so there's an instant tie between this Japanese catastrophe and U.S. involvement. <clears throat> but of course, our, our nuclear involvement, so to speak, goes back 70 years. And we just held a conference in Chicago to mark the 70th year since Enrico Fermi fired up the first atomic reactor in the world, the Chicago Pile 1 as part of the Manhattan Project, uh, the race for the bomb. So you can see an image, an artist's rendition of the pile there. And this is uh, Enrico Fermi. And the, the title of the conference was A Mountain of Radioactive Waste, 70 Years High. So um, of course, this was all about the bomb. And uh, these are images of the mushroom clouds at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so the radioactive risks began with the bomb project. And I should have mentioned that Enrico Fermi took a calculated risk, or maybe it was an uncalculated risk, at the University of Chicago. The original plan was to build that prototype reactor some 20 miles, 30 miles outside of town, where Argonne is now located. And uh, there was no time. They couldn't do it in time, so they decided to just do it at the University of Chicago. They didn't even inform the president of the university. They're doing this on the edge of downtown Chicago, and Fermi convinced his higher-ups that probably it would be okay. But some of his graduate students were assigned the task of what they called the suicide squad, and this was to pour a chemical solution onto the pile if something went wrong. There was another individual called the safety control rod axe man, who literally with his axe would chop a rope that was over a pulley and drop the control rod into the out-of-control reactor. 
And that term scram still sticks in the nuclear power industry. But as we saw at Fukushima Daiichi, you can scram a reactor when a 9.0 earthquake strikes, but the decay heat is enough to melt it down if you can't cool the cores. So again, with the history, we see Oppenheimer and Groves at the Trinity blast site. This was the precursor to the Nagasaki plutonium bomb and the aftermath of that shown. They didn't have to test the uranium bomb. It was sure to work, so they didn't test it. But, you know, as has been mentioned by uh, Dr. Fairley and Mary Olson, the, the fallout from the, uh, the Cold War, um, atomic bomb tests and hydrogen bomb tests. And this next section, um, Brian Victoria is right in the front row, so I owe a debt of gratitude to Professor Victoria because I learned history coming to Antioch University Midwest last Earth Day last year that I hadn't known about the early U.S. involvement in the Japanese nuclear power industry. So <clears throat> atomic weapons testing in the Pacific. Uh, just the, in mid-March of 2011, I happened to catch one of the episodes of CBS Evening News with Katie Couric, and it was uh, about Fukushima that day, and they showed these images on the right of the USS Ronald Reagan crew swabbing the decks in radiation protection gear because of being blanketed from Fukushima. And it just harkened back to these images from as early as 1946. And granted, that's a photo op. You can see the sailors are smiling. But they bore the brunt of that health damage over the years and decades after that. They are the atomic veterans. So um, the atom bomb testing going on in the Pacific, a cold war arms race with the Soviets well underway, and President Eisenhower gives a speech called Atoms for Peace at the United Nations in the early 1950s. And Arjun Makajani at IEER has written just an incredible book, if you haven't read it. It's called The Nuclear Power Deception. It came out in 1999, and I learned a lot about the propaganda machine, which was Atoms for Peace, because uranium mining and milling and processing and enrichment all had to be expanded for this arms race we were in with the Soviets. But how to sell that to the American people? Well, uh, Adams for Peace. It put a smiley face facade on this major expansion of all things nuclear. And remember, this is the early 1950s. The first so-called civilian atomic reactor was not fired up in Shipping Corps, Pennsylvania, under the direction of the head of the nuclear navy, so it's a civilian project, but it's a nuclear submarine reactor built on land, just to get it going. A lot, or even most, or even all of the uranium in this country that was being milled, being mined and milled and processed and enriched was feeding the arms race for not years, but decades, until the commercial industry started to really show up in the 1970s, and then the uranium supply started to shift over somewhat to fuel those reactors. So this, uh, again, the history that I learned from um, Brian Victoria, Castle Bravo was a, Castle was a series of hydrogen bomb tests that the United States carried out at places like Bikini. And on March 1st of 1954, the Bravo test got a little out of control. Uh, Edward Teller was involved in designing this bomb, as were other uh, scientists, and they miscalculated the yield of this explosion. They expected a five megaton blast, and they got more like a 15 megaton blast. And it, it still is the worst radiological um, contamination incident in the history of U.S. nuclear weapons testing. And this uh, Japanese tuna fishing boat, the Lucky Dragon Number no. 5, was unfortunately not very far away. You can see in the map on the right there, the blast bikini marked by a B, the, the Lucky Dragon marked by the F. They were outside of the zone that the United States had declared off limits. But, certain, but then later, uh, they redrew the danger zone, and they were well within that danger zone. And over time, uh, half of the crew of 23 died of their radiation exposures. One of the deaths occurred pretty quickly, within a matter of months. And it led to uh, an anti-nuclear groundswell in Japan, including a petition drive with many tens of millions of signatures against atomic bomb tests and against hydrogen bomb tests, and a million signatures alone from Hiroshima area. And the United States became very worried because there was uh, uh, this, this large groundswell of opposition to, to the nuclear energy establishment. And there were fears that uh, 
even the Soviet Union or China could take advantage of this situation and it's in the competition for loyalties after World War II. So again, the, the juxtaposition of images old and new. So on the left, uh, officials from the city of Tokyo testing the tuna from the Lucky Dragon and finding severe contamination. But like Cindy talked about, some of that tuna had already been sold, had already been consumed before it was, it was quarantined. And then on the right, this is actually an image from Thailand, not from Japan, but also dealing with the contamination of seafood post-Fukushima. Uh, 